You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 9, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, immunomodulators. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. He's a professor of medicine and the D. Lyons Missouri Chair in Immunology Research at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. immunomodulator and fit all possibilities here. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, immunomodulators and I'm not going to follow the outline that Artie Cavanaugh's article has uh, that uh, Chrissy uh, had attached to the emails to the fellows. It's worth reading the Artie Cavanaugh deal because you know he goes into some of the things about some of the rheumatologically based use of immunomodulators like IVIG. We're just going to touch on some of that. We're going to talk specifically about immunomodulators in relation to asthma because that's where day-to-day -day we uh, actually have a role. And I'm going to talk a little bit as we move on about some of the other newer trials being done with some of the different uh, anti-cytokine agents. And I'm going to end up uh, concentrating on the IL-1 family uh, because there have been some unusual syndromes that anti-IL-1 or IL-1 inhibitions have been uh, implicated in. And I think you're going to see more and more of those same kind of concepts applied uh, to straightforward asthma and allergy for reasons that we'll talk about. So this is not going to follow the exact um, replica of the attached uh, uh, chapter from the primer on uh, immunomodulators that Artie Cavanaugh and his colleagues have published. So I recommend that to people who want to be up to date on the materials that potentially can be What's the reference of value? It's the... Uh, Primer, which came out in 2009, uh, and uh, I think it's volume 125, and it's a supplement uh, in either the fourth or fifth month of those journals, but you can see it. It's supplement S, and the pages are 314 to 323. Uh, it's the Journal of Allergy? JACI. Right. It's the uh, Primer, which used to come in a booklet. Yeah. Now is an attachment to uh, volume 125 of the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. So I recommend that because there will be some aspects of immunomodulators that we won't uh, be going through. I have my disclosures. Uh, so there are a number of these uh, corporations, in particular uh, uh, Novartis, Merck, Biogenidec, uh, Abbott, um, Regeneron, Sanofi, Aventis that are all involved in developing anti-cytokine response um, uh, inhibitors. Uh, GSK and AstraZeneca also have uh, programs that we'll highlight that go through that as well. There are many targets uh, in immunomodulation based on our concepts of pathogenesis. So the first part of this talk is just a very quick review of asthma. You all know that airway inflammation uh, leads to obstruction and uh, increased airway responsiveness as a hallmark uh, for asthma. Uh, the um, pathology highlights the fact that there's a lot of immune cell activation with mast cells as well as uh, Th2 predominant uh, inflammation, but eosinophils and neutrophils also are clearly involved. Um, and then there are effects on the airway itself uh, with fibrosis, airway wall thickening, uh, mucus and myofibroblast hyperplasia uh, that uh, characterizes the remodeling concept. Um, this remodeling is clearly related to the physiologic phenomenon of airway hyperresponsiveness. Uh, and then there are the actual consequences of remodeling that is involved with uh, irreversible or partially reversible airway obstruction. So the reason for thinking about immunomodulators, since many of these processes I've just mentioned uh, are not steroid responsive, some of them are, you can obviously wipe out some aspects of inflammation with steroids. There are clearly going to be components that are elusive to the effects of steroids and um, what the hope is with the immunomodulators is that um, some of these basic uh, effects 
on remodeling and uh, the steroid non-responsive aspects in both the pediatric and adult age so categories. Some, some of these products can actually affect this decline in FEV1? Because none of the current yeah. treatments that we have can actually affect that. Right. It's a, Yeah, and no, and that's one of the things clearly that is steroid um, resistant. And in all the circumstances of moderately severe asthma where there's steroid insensitivity, a uh, component of it probably is related to this remodeling effect. And we know that there are things besides beta agonists and steroids and even leukotriene modifiers that don't influence whatever that process is. So there's a rationale for understanding the immunomodulators even beyond the fact that steroids, for the most part, are actually very good medications. Uh, this is not meant as a steroid bashing. Uh, no, they're very good for inflammation and symptoms. They yeah. just don't prevent this decline in FEV1. Yeah, well, it's hard to know how to prevent that decline in FEV1 because all of us after the age of 20 have a fall off of about 22 mLs per year of our airway function. And that's part of natural aging. So I don't think if you figure out the key to remodeling in asthma that you're going to figure out the key to aging and reverse aging. I think what you're hoping to do with uh, the immunomodulators that steroids aren't going to do is to move this 38 mL per year, which is a drop off in asthmatics. Non-smoker asthmatics will actually have a more rapid curve in terms of their FUV1 uh, fall, fall off. Um, you want to get them from 38 closer to 22, and you're not going to do that with steroid. The same thing is true even in pediatrics for lung growth. One of the things that come out of the um, CAMP and CARE network studies is that a lot of the goals of a lot of those interventions is to increase lung growth in these asthma uh, children. And um, many of these interventions with steroids or leukotriene modifiers don't have any effect on lung growth, normal lung growth between the age of 6 and 12, for example, where um, lungs continue to expand and not expand so much, but grow and uh, have greater, greater uh, functional physiologic capacities. So, um, you know, we're all very uh, familiar with this end of the spectrum in terms of the cytokines that are generated during an immune response to an allergen and um, in particular, there's been a lot of uh, interest on IL-5 and IL-4 and IL-13, not only for the effects on eosinophils and mast cells and other lymphocytes that might be activated besides Th2 cells, but also because of the effect on the actual lung structure that's probably part of this hyper-responsiveness remodeling aspect that um, is somewhat steroid independent. Uh, it, when it was just Th1 and Th2 cells, the yin-yang hypotheses uh, that underlied things like the hygiene hypothesis was very simple and clearly not correct. We now know that there are a variety of other CD4 positive cells, if you will, depending on the milieu in which they're developed from the precursor cells that can have other function. One of the ones that's gained a lot of interest over the past couple of years are the T regulatory cells that can shut off some of these responses in all of these classes of uh, T cell differentiation. And also the Th17 cells, uh, which is not only important in mimicking some of the functions of Th1 cells, but as you'll see, there's some aspects of Th17 cytokine family members that are very active in generating allergic and asthmatic inflammation as well. So Th17 can play a major role uh, in uh, asthma. The CD4 positive, CD25 positive T lymphocytes uh, that are regulatory in function express TGF beta and IL-10. They actually secrete them. And these have been differentiated into uh, whether or not IL-10 secretion occurs in those cells or not, and whether that secreted IL-10 works. In the mouse, there's evidence to believe that it's not just secretion, but actually expression of TGF beta and IL-10 on the surface of these T regulatory cells that's important for delivering an inhibitory signal uh, to the cells that get suppressed. Um, they are suppressive to the other T cells I've mentioned. They express FOXP3 transcription factor. And one of the roles of TGF beta signaling in the T cells as it uh, develops 
uh, into the T regulatory cells is uh, TGF beta induction of FOXP3 to get fully functional T regulatory cells. There are also unique growth factors that the T regulatory cells utilize. IL-34 and IL-35 are growth factors specifically for these T regulatory cells. In terms of the complexity of asthma, you've heard me talk about this before in other settings about uh, asthma, asthma pathogenesis. It's a very complex process. These cartoons that we show of uh, TH2 mediated inflammation, T cell mediated inflammation, cytokine networks and cascades, as well as effects on the structural uh, components in the lung. All of them uh, occur not only as we draw them in, as cartoons, but they occur in three dimensions. Uh, all the molecules, cells, tissues, and organs all interact in a unique kind of way. And even a fourth dimension, because as uh, people's lungs um, develop, uh, there are developmental effects that an asthmatic milieu will have uh, that's different than a normal milieu and maybe different than a lung that's developed that's normal, uh, but in a, in a circumstance where there's uh, cigarette smoke or other kinds of environmental toxins, mold, for example. All of that can affect the dynamics of these complex uh, interactions. But there's no change in the genome of a patient who has asthma, their lungs versus their, their stem cells, their basic yeah. cells. Um, it's not a genetic mutation that causes somebody to develop asthma like you would with cancer, where you would sequence the cancer genome, for example. Right. But is there a, uh, an abnormality in the transcription because of the environmental inhalation that modifies transcription in cells that are exposed to environmental things that might be different? There's a genetic component to this whole process. There's no question that it's that the host genome has an effect. But it's not a mutation from the stem cells. What it is is multiple polymorphisms across the whole right. genome each contribute a little bit. So that is a basic effect of the genome that's uh, transmitted generation to generation according to Mendelian rules. Um, there are effects of, on the genome that are not transmitted that way that are environmentally triggered. And that's a concept known as epigenetics. So there may be other aspects of gene remodeling, if you will, uh, based on histone deacetylation and other things right. that alter the way in which the genome um, can be expressed. Um, and then there's like somatic mutations which can occur. We know, for example, in mastocytosis, somatic mutations of the receptor for stem cell factor uh, is one of the predisposing factors for the development of mastocytosis. And that's not something that's transmitted from generation to generation, but people who get an exposure, whether it's to a virus or a toxin, potentially can get that somatic mutation. So there's epigenetics, somatic mutations, and then there are transcriptionally mediated events mm -hmm. that also influence the output of certain genes and all of them can contribute. So it's a complex gene environment interaction that's com complex at the level we're talking about here. Right. The issue of immunomodulators, I'll get to it, is that I think, unlike steroids, immunomodulators are closer to pathogenesis. Mm. So that's probably why they might have an intuitive advantage in terms of the overall treatment. But we haven't hit on the right combinations or maybe the right factors yet. As complex as asthma is, our expert panels, uh, of which there's been three or fours, three or four of them uh, haven't done a much better job in terms of making a simplified therapy. So we have six steps and patient education, environmental control, uh, immunotherapy of various sorts can be factored in along with the pharmacotherapy and all these different complex steps. So I'm just showing this to identify the steps at which um, immunomodulators are now part of the actual treatment algorithm. So we only have one, as we've mentioned, or as we will mention, omalizumab. Uh, there's clearly some role for biotherapeutics in the latest iteration of the expert panel. The long-term controllers and quick relief medications are very uh, important. But as all we already highlighted, uh, when you're at the end of the rope with step four, or five, or six asthmatics, and they're still getting exacerbations going to the ER, to the doctor's office for unplanned visits uh, or hospitalizations. There's still an issue of other treatments. Before omalizumab, we had three alternatives. 
there was some interest now 20 years ago in the use of methotrexate because in a number of autoimmune diseases, methotrexate had been shown to be somewhat uh, valuable before biomodulators were part of those kinds of treatments. So there were a bunch of studies, most of which some of them came out slightly ahead, some slightly negative, but overall methotrexate was not an important um, intervention in uh, the more, most severe asthmatic. Cyclosporin had some very potentially intriguing results uh, that looked very promising, but the use of cyclosporin for more than a month or two in people who are at step four or five asthma and might have years and years of pretty intense treatment uh, was really limited by the toxicity. And another treatment in that category is IVIG, a very expensive treatment because we're talking about two grams per kilogram, the highest dose for immunomodulation associated with IVIG. So you're not titrating the IVIG to get to 500 milligrams uh, per deciliter in the serum of somebody with immunodeficiency. You're giving a huge quantity for an unknown mechanism of immunomodulation. And that ranged from altering balances of all these CD4 T cells, inhibiting the dendritic cells through FC receptors for IgG on their surface, having cryptic anthocera against chlamydia and against other things that can never be detected but were theoretically possible in an IVIG mix. Um, and then there's pretty good evidence that complement activation actually uh, can be dampened in terms of inhibiting some of the downstream effects of C3A and C5A, some of the complement split products that might be activated in some um, immunological reactions. So IVIG has provided dozens and dozens of publications, none of which have been definitive about how it works. But needless to say, at the highest dose, two grams per kilogram, it probably has had some effect in asthma patients. The controlled trials are a little bit better than methotrexate if you look at the Cochrane analysis, but it's uh, still not an overwhelmingly positive uh, result in terms of its influence. IVIG as an immunomodulator is in other diseases is clearly established. So if you look at ITP, it's one of the earliest steps for the treatment of um, immune thrombocytopenic purpura. It's been uh, efficacious there. It's been shown to be efficacious in Kawasaki syndrome in kids. It's been shown to be efficacious in Guillain-Barre, uh, syndrome resolution. So there are a lot of controlled trials where the IVIG has been shown to have an effect. So it's a reasonable treatment for that. For asthma, it's really borderline at best. The only thing we've had the last eight years is omalizumab or anti-IgE. You've had multiple discussions and presentations. We won't go through all the effects about omalizumab. You've all known how to utilize it in terms of the algorithm and the treatment, whatever. One point that I'm sure you're all aware of now is a fully humanized monoclonal antibody that's used for therapy either has a, a Z or an M at that point. So if you see the name of the real name, not the trade name, this is Zolaire, but uh, the real name, the name accepted by the International Union of Immunological Scientists for these drugs, uh, has either a Z or an M for a fully humanized antibody. For a chimeric antibody that has a high percentage of either mouse or primate non-human uh, for the components of immunoglobulin, there's an X there. So rituxin has an X for rituximab. Um, uh, infliximab or Remicade has an X because it's a chimeric antibody. These humanized antibodies have a half-life of normal IgG, so it's in the range of 21 to 25 or 26 days. The half-life of the chimeric antibodies, infliximab, uh, rituximab, those are usually 8 to 10 days. So the half-life of something like Remicade is much, much less than Umira or Adomimumab. Some of these names are pretty funny. So, <laughs> Anyhow, Poor responses to medications can be related to drugs and host-related social issues in terms of insurance coverage, patient-related, pharmacogenetics, since Dr. Johnson is going to speak next about her research, it's always worth bringing that up. And You can get variations in various pathways of asthma treatment that are um, influenced by certain genotypes or gene-by-environment interactions, and some examples are there. <clears throat> 
So immunomodulators are closer to pathogenesis. They're disease altering and modifying. I think they're the wave of the future. Cost effectiveness has been a major issue. One of the things when Zolaire was first introduced is a lot of people were resistant to its use because it costs so much. Well, I think that'll change. There's now a tremendously up-ramped um, means of production for all these kinds of biotherapeutics worldwide, uh, so it's not as expensive to produce them as much. And actually, to be honest, at some point, I think the cost of these biotherapeutics is going to approach the cost of some of the... Uh, complicated devices with high, you know, high cost types of designer steroids and long-acting beta agonists. Uh, some of these newer ones that are being developed aren't really providing a great advance in terms of long-acting beta agonists or inhaled steroids, but they're just getting little glitches on the molecules that make them last for 24 hours rather than 12. Um, so we'll see. I think the cost effectiveness will progress. The interesting thing about immunomodulators is uh, with Zolaire, we know that it enhances the safety of, uh, of standard immunotherapy from the study that's been done by the Immune Tolerance Network. Uh, but uh, I don't think we've fully explored the advantage of omalizumab in a variety of other circumstances in terms of allergy uh, that we possibly can in terms of looking at cases of anaphylaxis, looking at cases of, let's say, address syndrome where it might play a role uh, in some other circumstances as well for non-IgE-related effects because they definitely exist with, uh, with omalizumab. So immunomodulators potentially have that benefit as well. And, you know, with respect to the cost, it may not get cheaper, but we're, we just get accustomed to paying more for the drugs, I remember when terfenidine first came out and it was a dollar a pill and we thought that was outrageous and there was all this controversy about it. Now a dollar a pill seems like a pretty cheap drug. So we just get used to paying more for our drugs. Uh, what was that quote in, about the Pentagon in the 1950s, you know? A billion here and a billion here and soon you're yeah. talking about real money, right? Mm -hmm. So something that was uh, $10,000 a year for treatment uh, sounded like it was way outrageous or 10000 a month. Now, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, having high-level, uh, high-dose inhaled steroid therapy, um, <clears throat> I'm sure that's going to be very expensive for a, lot of, uh, for a lot of people who have to pay for it out of pocket as opposed to uh, health plans and other things. Okay, well, you know, the cytokine cascades have really been worked out over the last 20 to 25 years. About 15 years ago, there was some, at the initial, initial uh, utilization of some kind of inhibition of cytokines in asthma, there were about five or six different approaches that were taken. And some of them generated some very interesting early information uh, and enthusiasm that unfortunately never worked out. It's, been take, it's taken about another 10 years or so before we're on the cusp of some other kinds of things that might work. A uh, soluble interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. Uh, it's actually part of the IL-1 family, IL-1-RA. It's known as anakinra or kinaret. We'll talk a little bit more about that because it's been accepted more in the um, uh, rheumatologic and inflammatory disease category. It's never really gotten a full um, airing and or study in asthma, and I think that's one of the big holes. There is a soluble IL-1 receptor that is very similar to the soluble uh, TNF receptor known as Embrel, and there was a soluble IL-4 receptor that was called Nuvance uh, that could inhibit both IL-1 and IL-4. This was done by a company called Immunex that became part of Amgen. The soluble IL-1 receptor, there was a guy called Mike Malarkey who did studies for Immunex and eventually Amgen, that he was able to show that the early and late phase response to inhaled allergen was inhibited both at the inhaled level as well as at the skin test level with soluble IL-1 receptor. Uh, and that never got progressed to an actual clinical trial as, as that stopped. This utilized an IL-1 receptor that was attached to the FC portion of immunoglobulin, so that its half-life was about 21 days, because the FC portion of human IgG is the, the signal for clearance of all the immunoglobulins. So, um, Embrel has a half-life equivalent to some of the antibodies, mainly because it's got this FC portion of 
IgG attached to the soluble TNF receptor. Uh, so that's what happens with Embro. There are also humanized anti-TNF antibodies I've already mentioned. Some of them, there was a IL-1 receptor attached to the um, FC portion of immunoglobulin. There's actually something that's now available on the market for some very distinct syndromes we'll talk about in the IL-1 area uh, that actually links a couple of IL-1 receptors uh, as a IL-1 trap, if you will, uh, for inflammatory diseases that works very well. Uh, one thing that hasn't worked well, if we could even talk about some of these antibodies and receptor antagonists, at least theoretically working, even if their clinical trials were questionable, one thing that ever worked um, was, for example, you could know 15 years ago that the hygiene hypothesis was totally screwed up, at least from the point of view of a Th1, Th2 balance. And you knew that because you could make an argument that interferon gamma deficiency was what you got in a Th1 deficient circumstance. If that were the case, then interferon gamma should work alone to replace uh, the deficiency in asthma. And it doesn't. It has no effect in asthma. has no effect in atopic dermatitis. So um, that theory was out the window. IL-12 induced Th1-like lymphocyte differentiation, as does IL-18. And IL-12, given as the whole treatment for cancer patients, was too toxic to be tolerated, even in cancer patients. So that went out the window. It's never really tried in asthma. IL-10 and TGF-beta were anti-inflammatory cytokines. And you figured if the secreted theory related to Tregs work, these might work as well. But some of the treatment with IL-10 was associated with a little bit more uh, toxicity than you would have liked in cancer subjects where it was tried, and in certain autoimmune models where it was thought that it might be anti-inflammatory because of its effect on Th1 responses. Uh, so these never really took off. So whole cytokine therapy has never worked, which is interesting because it means that these diseases are not related to deficiencies in cytokines or cytokine receptors, but are more subtle influences on the balance of expression of the receptors and the cytokine levels terms of immunomodulation. This is from a, a review that was in the, that was in CHEST uh, by, uh, in 2007 by uh, Paul Byrne. And it, it reviewed at that time all the studies with IL-4 inhibition or IL-5 inhibition or TNF inhibition uh, for the treatment of asthma. And there were some early studies done by our department that showed that you could use inhaled IL-4 receptor NuVance and get an important effect on steroid withdrawal and improvement of physiology. Uh, we, this was done in two studies that totaled about 90 patients uh, from two centers. And um, when it was expanded to a bigger trial of about 600, this benefit sort of went away. So the inhaled IL-4 looked promising, and then it didn't work in IL dial 4 inhibition. Uh, there were studies with anti-IL-5 had a similar effect in that uh, one month's treatment with anti-IL-5 blocked uh, production of uh, eosinophils from bone marrow into the peripheral blood, but the tissue eosinophils were not affected, and there was no effect after just one month's treatment with um, respiratory physiology in terms of uh, FEV1 or PC20. There is some evidence that TNF uh, treated and blocked by the embryo uh, soluble TNF receptor actually had some effect in asthma. We'll go through some of that data next because that's another story. That also has led to a blind alley for reasons that I'll mention. This is from studies uh, that uh, Peter Howarth did looking at mild and severe asthma in terms of their biopsy and relative gene expression for TNF alpha in the airways of individuals uh, with severe asthma. This was a non-randomized, um, non, uh, where the control was only internal control. So it was almost like an anecdotal study they did uh, in Southampton. Uh, and they showed that if you gave Embrel to those subjects, you actually improved their s symptom score, giving them 12 weeks therapy with uh, Embrel, getting an injection every two weeks. Uh, for that period of time. 
Uh, there was also um, an effect of Embrel on methicoline sensitivity, and this was published in Thorax in 2006. And in 2006, there was a study published in the New England Journal by Ivan Pavord, um, Ian Pavord, and uh, Mike Berry from Leicester in the UK, where they were able to show that a 12-week or 10-week, excuse me, trial of Embrel uh, reduced uh, the PC20 significantly in those individuals who received Embrel as opposed to placebo. So this was a prospective double-blinded study in moderately severe asthmatics. Uh, and it also improved their quality of life significantly, as you can see there. And if you look at post-bronchodilator FEV1 over the 10-week period, there clearly was uh, an effect with Embrel that wasn't seen in placebo. So this generated uh, large studies, larger studies, with both Embrel and uh, with uh, Umira, Adalimumab, um, that just started. And uh, both of them, I think there was a total of 250 subjects. In this one, you saw this was like uh, 10 or 15 subjects in each arm of the study. In 250 subjects in two different trials, uh, seven top solid tumors developed in the groups who received the embryo. A much stronger signal for cancer than was seen in any of the rheumatologic uh, or other autoimmune syndromes treated with Embrel or Umira. So the trials were stopped, and actually um, Bous Jean Bousquet and Sally Wenzel wrote this up, and I think it was in the Blue Journal about a year ago, of those numbers uh, from those trials. So that was such a high signal that no company is willing to touch uh, TNF blockade in asthma just on the basis of those early data this in the embryo trials of those tumors to see if they were some, something unusual. Yeah, I don't know if that's ongoing or if people are looking into that, but that would be certainly an important thing to do. I, you know, I think TNF is an important player in the airway inflammation, and I think IL-1 is, which is what my next little subject will be, or, which are part of other potential treatments that uh, immunomodulation can lead to. The IL-17 family and the TH17 cells, I think, are an important target. IL-17A and F are pro-fibrotic that induce chemokines and mediate fibrosis. There's actually six genes in the IL-17 family. IL-17E, the fifth gene, is actually IL-25, which is associated with TH2-mediated activation and airways hyper-responsiveness. And the genetics of the whole IL-17 family is linked to asthma, not only the IL-25 gene, but other genes within IL-17 as well. So this whole locus is probably something uh, that gets activated in asthma, may play a role in asthmatic inflammation. The point about this is that IL-17 uh, production and TH17 cells is highly dependent on IL-6. And in fact, in lupus, studies of in which people have tried to neutralize the TH17 cells have shown to be somewhat effective. And those studies involved use of a monoclonal antibody to the IL-6 receptor. The IL-6 receptor is a homodimer of two proteins known as GP130, and antibodies to GP130 in Japan have been shown to influence the course of SLE. So there is some hope that it might work. Therefore, I think IL-17 inhibition becomes something that is a good target in asthma as well. And then IL-1 is the one that I would like to concentrate a little bit on. There's actually uh, about 11 members in the IL-1 gene family. Uh, most of them are on chromosome 2Q13, spread out over a long distance, so it's not a tight locus. But um, uh, and there's a couple of genes in this process that are not in that locus. They're, they've migrated to other sites within the genome, but they clearly have family, um, based on their gene organization and their structure, there's clearly a family relationship between all of these 11 genes. So, is that the new nomenclature now? Or you these are the IL-1 and then an F? Well, like this is the, these are one? the names for the genes. Mm -hmm. So this is the genes. The gene for IL-1 alpha is IL-1 F1. The gene for IL-1 beta is IL-1 F2. 
And these both are pro-inflammatory. That means they have an agonist effect. IL-1, another one in the IL-1 family is IL-18, uh, and that has IL-1F4 is the gene for that. It clearly works. This one, IL-1 uh, epsilon, uh, hasn't been identified in any disease state yet, but the prediction from its structure is that it would be like these other agonists. IL-1-RA is a receptor antagonist. This is the drug, anakinra, and the gene for that is IL-1-F3. Um, there are other receptor antagonists, like IL, the IL-1-F10 has a name, IL-1-HY2. I have no idea. But there's a couple of other ones in there that have become very uh, prominent in the last couple of years. Uh, IL-1-F11 is IL-33. IL-33's receptor is ST2, which is a unique receptor just on Th2 cells. So IL-33 was thought to be an important agonist in asthma. And there are uh, programs that uh, Amgen's developing to inhibit IL-33 in asthma. More recently, some work from Japan has identified IL-33 not so much as a stimulator of Th2-mediated immunity, but really as a major regulator of innate immunity across the board. So it may have a greater effect than just allergy asthma effects as well. So IL-33 is one of the interesting cytokines that are in the IL-1 um, family. Uh, this IL-1F9, this IL-1 epsilon, it's got another name. One of these may be IL-32. It's not clear, and that hasn't been nailed down yet in this but IL-32 is a TNF inducer that's from the IL-1 family. And IL-37 is the newest one that's been uh, shown to have an influence in host defense and disease. And it seems to have a similar effect to IL-1-RA or anakinra. So IL-37 is potentially something that could be used as a therapy as well. The extended IL-1 family, as I mentioned, uh, all of them are caspase-1 dependent for their secretion. They have an unusual structure that doesn't have a leader sequence in the protein structure. So for them to get out of the cells, the caspase, which are part of the uh, intracellular enzymes that might be involved with apoptosis, but also are involved with cellular regu regulation, uh, is involved in the activation of all of these cytokines and their cleavage so that they can be secreted. So IL-18 has shared receptor and genetics with uh, the IL-1, standard IL-1s. IL-32, as I mentioned, is a TNF inducer. IL-33 is a ligand for ST2 that induces Th2 cytokines. And IL-37, like IL-1RA, is involved in the downregulation of IL-1 family activities. Um, so you've heard of this concept of uh, the TNF receptor associated with an FC uh, receptor uh, uh, fragment producing embryo that blocks inflammation that's TNF dependent and TNF receptor shedding enabled them to identify TNFR1 as the thing they were going to use for antenoreceptor embryo. Similar ideas have been developed for IL-1 blockade. But there's a natural protein, IL-1-RA, and a Kinra that is the drug that will block the IL-1 receptor from being activated uh, to cause inflammation, fever, rash, pain, immune responsiveness. Hal Hoffman's done a lot of work on this because this IL-1 inflammasome pathway are associated with cryopririn-associated cryo periodic syndromes. Familial code urticaria is involved in genetic variants in the cryopyrin gene that lead to cold-triggered inflammatory febrile episodes, urticaria-like rash, conjunctivitis, and amyloidosis, and long-term disease. I don't think we see that in these diseases much because they're diagnosed a little bit sooner. Muckle-Well syndrome is in the same category with different mutations within cryopyrin. And NOMID uh, is a uh, pediatric disease which, that uh, also is associated with uh, changes in the cryopyrin gene. All of these inflammasome-related diseases have been shown to be targeted for therapy with IL-1. Um, and uh, let me see. Now, I, let me go back. <coughs> 
Yeah, so all of these caps are sensitive to IL-1 inhibition. Um, besides the CAP syndromes, uh, there's anecdotal information and or animal model data to suggest that targeting IL-1-related inflammasome may be useful in gout, both acute and chronic gout, pseudogout, type 2 diabetes, and post-MI remodeling. So IL-1 is an important factor, potentially, and a lot of the things that you could see might influence uh, airway remodeling and asthma. So it's, you're using it to treat MIs now? Well, that's an animal model thing oh, okay. that hasn't been gone. But uh, Peter Libby at the Brigham and Women's Hospital has been the major proponent of IL-1 uh, being an important factor. IL-1 is probably, the, and the IL-1 family, probably the greatest influence on SED rate. So it induces C-reactive protein. So when you're measuring CRPs in people who might be at risk for developing an MI, it's an IL-1-related link that might, that's involved in that clinical uh, uh, circumstance. So that's possibly one of it. One of the other things associated with atherosclerotic disease is periodontal disease. And one of the genetic association, besides cryopyrin and CAPS and response to inflammation, uh, is that uh, there are genetic variants of the IL-1 gene that are highly tightly linked to periodontal disease. So, and that's another form of chronic inflammation that could affect things. This CRP effect and the IL-1 process may directly be occurring directly within the vasculature. So, um, you know, the cardiologists and others who work on inflammation of, uh, of the vasculature and the heart uh, have been interested in IL-1 for that reason. One of the things that we've seen in the clinic, we have a couple of patients uh, with adult onset stills who've responded really well uh, to anakinra, one of the IL-1-related disease. The pediatric disease of stills, systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis, is highly, highly IL-1 responsive in terms of anakinra. Most of these data have been done with anakinra. There are other agents now available. Uh, you could consider this also for neutrophilic urticaria, neutrophilic lung disorders in terms of blocking IL-1. Uh, and uh, um, Alan Wanderer in January had a rostrum-like uh, speculation in the annals of allergy and clinical immunology uh, that suggested IL-1 blockade may be very helpful in neutrophilic asthma. I go beyond that. I think <coughs> IL-1 is generally involved in inflammation not just neutrophilic, but eosinophilic as well. Eosinophils have IL-1 receptors, IL-1 of all stripes that are agonists activate eosinophils. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't limit it to neutrophilic asthma. And there are other neutrophilic diseases that are rare that are IL-1 related. Besides anakinra, which is the natural IL-1 RA, the third gene in that family of IL-1s, there are actually two FDA-approved drugs that have been approved because of their use in the CAPS syndrome, those unusual uh, Muckle Wells familial cold urticaria uh, group. There's one called Rolonicept, which is a dimer of uh, uh, IL-1 receptors with an FC receptors. This Rolonicept is also known as IL-1 trap. So I, I'm a consultant for Regeneron. Regeneron makes this IL-1 trap. It's approved for CAPS. They'd like to go after gout. That's their next indication that uh, both Regeneron and Novartis, which has made a monoclonal, humanized monoclonal anti-IL-1, which is called canakinumab, which is right there. That also is very effective in blocking IL-1 beta activity. This is the rolonicept IL-1 trap. It's a dimeric fusion protein specific blocker of IL-1, incorporating components required for IL-1 signaling. Both the IL-1 receptor and the IL-1 receptor accessory protein, these both activate a, a kinase called IRAC. And in one of the immune deficiencies, you can get IRAC deficiency that leads to prolonged NF-kappa B activation. So this pathway is an important inflammatory process. This trap that has the two IL-1 receptors is hooked up to an FC receptor as well, and it's approved for CAPS, an unusual disease. So there's about 100 patients on therapy. 
canakinumab also got approved about a year after that other one. It's a fully human IgG anti-IL-1 beta monoclonal antibody, half-life greater than 21 days, directly binds and neutralizes IL-1 beta, approved for cats, and it's also got about 150 patients that are being treated with it. So the CAPS uh, group can be treated with either canakinumab, rolonisept, or anakinra. The easiest one, since it's been on the market the longest, is anakinra uh, or kinaret. And as we've said, a number of the patients in the clinic with adult onset stills and some other diseases have made good responses to kinaret. This is just some of the publications related to the different uh, aspects of kinaret and cats. But I put it up here because this is not the best drug to give. It has a half-life of about 12 hours because it's a natural protein. And its affinity for the IL-1 receptor is pretty close to what IL-1 binds. So you have to give a whole lot of it every day. So the people who get kinaret, like our patient over at um, Truman, has to be injected every day. So it's somewhat painful. Um, and obviously, this is in spite of how much it costs. If only there, there are only about three or four hundred patients, five hundred patients. It's not exactly what you could make a lot of money on, which I'm sure is a stimulant stimulation for students. There are other recurrent fever disorders that Kinneret's been used in. The traps, the hyper IgD, and FMF all seem to be responsive to IL-1 inhibition as well. And obviously, these can be seen in both pediatrics as well as in adult patients. Um, complex disorders, this is for Kinneret beyond those other ones. We've already talked about these potential indications for IL-1 targeted therapy. In terms of safety issues from these small numbers of patients who've been approved, um, gram-positive pathogens potentially may be infections if you have no IL-1. That's data from mouse models where the IL-1 receptors are knocked out and in humans who have IRAC4 kinase deficiency, where the IL-1 receptor links to IRAC. <coughs> so pathogens uh, can potentially work. There's no increased mycobacterial infections, which you might have predicted with this pathway of uh, inflammation, although there are some increased upper respiratory infections. Um, increased cholesterol, cholesterol and atherosclerosis, congestive heart failure, weight gain, I don't think these are anything that's been easily identified in small numbers who are taking it. These are more concerns. And from uh, extrapolated data, the cardiovascular complications for IL-1 targeted therapy do exist. So I would have thought that atherosclerosis would have been decreased. Yeah, well, it's the same thing with the concepts about what might be something that people who are on Zoller might be at risk for. Uh, would they likely develop uh, overwhelming parasitemia or some of the other things. Those are things I heard about, you know, when we were thinking about utilizing Zoware for the treatment of asthma. I, I think these are things that are fitting in the same kind of speculation. And as you point out, if IL-1 is a big trigger for atherosclerosis, this is a totally specious assumption. I can only say, though, that this is what people raise as things to consider as possibilities. Um, and there are trials of other IL-1 inhibition in particular in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. The final destruction of islets is highly dependent on IL-1 from macrophages that are infiltrating the uh, islets and killing the, you know, this acid, the um, non-acid or pancreas. So there's a big in interest in utilizing some of the treatments uh, for IL-1 inhibition in, in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, yeah, you know, same kind of precautions you would take with TNF inhibition in terms of infectious complications. Um, the last thing to bring up is the issue of IL-5 and asthma. As I, as I mentioned, some trial designs that had significant flaws and defect um, with the early use of anti-IL-5 and asthma withheld some of the interest in looking at it for a number of years. Um, when anti-IL-5 was shown to have a significant effect on steroid reduction in hyperosinophilic syndrome, uh, it also occurred to people that it might have a similar effect utilizing the criteria of steroid reduction and reduction in exacerbation in asthma. And there were two trials two years ago, 
uh, utilizing anti-IL-5 in the treatment of asthma, uh, predominantly with mepolizumab. Uh, I'll highlight some of the data from that in a second. But there's something called reslizumab, which is the other anti-IL-5 that had been tried 10 years ago and found to not influence physiology. And there's also studies now being developed by Metamune and AstraZeneca called METI-563, in which the target is the actual IL-5 receptor rather than IL-5. And preliminary data um, published about a year ago uh, in the JACI suggests it might work. Besides the hyperosinophilic syndrome, Sherb Strauss has also been shown to be responsive uh, to anti-IL-5 in terms of looking at eosinophil activity and Sherb Strauss activity independent of asthma. Now, the two studies on asthma from two years ago, one was from uh, Lester, again, uh, Dr. Haldar and colleagues, including Andy Wardlaw uh, and Ian Pavord and Mike Berry in Lester, and Parham there and uh, Paul O'Byrne in uh, Hamilton. And um, you can see here uh, steroid-dependent asthma with sputum eosinophilia. This is from the NAIR uh, paper. You clearly had an advantage in terms of uh, placebo versus mepolizumab in terms of exacerbation, as well as, uh, and this is just another way of looking at exacerbation. Um, and uh, quality of life uh, also was significantly in, improved with mepolizumab and steroid reduction also uh, in both studies. I'm sorry, I, what I have it here is this is the um, the NAIR paper is Mrs. Haldar. We had the same data on both. The same thing is true here, uh, the NAIR paper and the Haldar paper. So anti-IL-5 in terms of these effects on um, quality of life and asthma, eosinophilia, and exacerbations uh, seems to play a role. The key was that these patients were carefully selected in Hamilton for having sputum eosinophilia and in uh, Leicester to fit one of their clusters uh, where eosinophilia and the sputum is a prominent part of this cluster. So with a highly selected population, anti-IL-5 has been shown to be effective. Some of the arguments at the time those papers came out is, well, that's very nice for a well-selected group, but what would happen across the board in asthma? So some people had some skepticism about that. It hasn't yet been resolved. Um, Besides all these antibodies and all these other things, the model for looking at both small molecules as well as antibodies uh, involves looking at antigen presenting cell or B cell interaction with T cells. And there are three or four signals involved in this activation. A lot of receptors and then downstream kinases get activated. They're all targets for either small molecules, uh, inhibitors of kinases, uh, as you see here inhibitors of calcineurin and other kinases uh, in the T cell receptor uh, linkage, cell cycle inhibitors like cyclosporin, or excuse me, azathioprine and um, cyclophosphamide that would uh, fit in this circumstance uh, that would inhibit T cell activation that way. Inhibitors of activation of T cell related cytokines such as NFAT inhibitors, <coughs> caffeine inhibitors, and some of them are also expressed in dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells that interact with the lymphocytes. Where's the graphic from? This one? Mm -hmm. It's um, from a transplantation article in the New England Journal about two years ago. I don't, I forget the author. I should put the attribution down at the bottom, so I'm sorry. But I don't like to think about attribution. I just like to look at the pictures, <laughs> even though they're in two dimensions. Uh, this, are, this, this, uh, this slide I got from uh, Sally, so you can judge its veracity based on, uh, on its source. But this just shows in asthma uh, which of these inhibitors that we've already talked about have come into play. The only one that's been approved is omalizumab here, uh, but there's been a variety of both small molecules and antibodies that have been used to try and get it all of these aspects of the cartoon of asthma-related inflammation. Uh, the ones that are directed at most of the integrins and adhesion, as well as the chemokines, have all failed. Uh, so it's not just the actual cytokines that have 
um, had a spotty record in terms of their efficacy in asthma. The anti-adhesion uh, seemed to do even even worse. Anti-eosinophil treatments are look promising, but it's taken a long time. We've already talked about many 563, which is actually the IL-5 receptor. This many 528 is an anti-IL-9 activity. It not only affects eosinophils, but could also affect mast cells. I don't know where those are. Is this the mast cell here? It must be. So there's the other things here. This R112343 is a sick kinase inhibitor. There's a variety of other kinds of inhibitors here. Dequizumab uh, is an antibody to the IL-2 receptors that actually look pretty promising, although it hasn't been approved for asthma as well. There's a variety of any of these other things that you could see. The presentation is on the desktop here. So if you want this slide, you can get it, or the prior one, just from uh, just from the pictures. So uh, that's it for the topic I have. Uh, I'm always pushing the WOW journal. Anybody want to make a review on any of these things, just let me know and we can write it, or you can write it, and we'll publish it if it's well received by peer review. Uh, we have the World Allergy Congress in Cancun in December, so I just like everyone to know about it. Fellows, there are travel grants that are going to be available. So if you want to put in an abstract uh, of your work or of different things, I'm sure it would be well received. So this took a little longer than I thought, so I apologize. But uh, anybody have any questions? I'd be glad to answer. That was great. Um, so in 2030, you had a slide allergy in 2000. Yeah. What What will we be doing in 2030? What crystal ball? Well, I think um, we'll. Uh, Want me to go back to that? Slide? You could if you want. But it doesn't matter. I, I think we'll have some of the concepts of personalized medicine that people have been throwing around for a while. Um, so I'm not too. Uh, yeah, I, I think we'll have um, pharmacogenetic profiling. I don't think that'll be the prominent part. I think we'll have a lot more biotherapeutics because I think the concept of getting small molecules to do everything these antibodies do is not going to be specious. It's going to be too expensive. It won't be likely that it will work. So getting a small molecule inhibitor to do what the IL-1 receptor trap or anti-IL-2 or some of the other antibodies that are potentially there, I don't think that will work. So I think biotherapeutics will be you know, still in effect. Pharmacogenetic profiling will fit. I wrote this in 2004 when I was president of the academy for my presidential address, and I was figuring all the stuff that I was interested in was going to take at least 25 years to have any kind of impact. So that's how the thought process went into 2030. But I think that all these cascades that we showed pictures of, the ones that were well defined as well as the ones with all the interventions, uh, like the one from Casali that probably is not a good one to follow, all of these cascades are going to be subjected to something called systems biology. Um, if you get the annual review of immunology this year in 2011, it's my Bible. Yeah, I don't know about that, but there is a, a very dense treatise by a fellow named Ron Germain, who's one of the basic immunologists at the NIAID, who talks about system biology application to immunology. And if you're interested in, in reading something that'll be hard to understand and can put you to sleep, that would be a good thing. But I think that that approach will be how we'll solve how all these cascades really work. So I think if we do that, we have some of this stuff. The key to me is early intervention. If you can find a child who's at risk at age six months or two or three and really have something that you know might be an early intervention, and I think the only thing that becomes safe in that circumstance is not a drug but these immunomodulators. So you're talking about primary prevention. Yeah. Prevention, er, early prevention in terms of causing the immune system to be developed in ways that it may not be pulled in people at risk for allergy. So er, early intervention is the thing that's most exciting of all these to me. Well, I fully expect by 2030 all of us will have our genomes sequenced in some kind of a database. And um, at that point, then, won't it be possible to tailor specific interventions for individuals as opposed to this kind of 
everybody with asthma take an inhaled steroid? Yeah, no, I think pharmacogenetic profile is there. And, you know, it's frustrating because people around here who get into this personalized medicine deal, they want it to be something that in two years everybody will be able to do that. Uh, it's just We're impatient. Yeah, well, I'm in pa I've been promising these things since 1987. So, so look, I'm getting older. I need it to happen Me before too. I, I get so old yeah. that it will be too late. I, well, you know. There you go. Brock, do you have anything you want to do to add? You've been awfully quiet. Go ahead, Brock. Uh, as usual, that was really incredible, uh, Lanny. And uh, I'll have to agree with you. I have impatience, too. I think as we age, we get more impatient. <laughs> yeah. It's going to get too late, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, some of us have dropped the delusion of knowing that we're going to see the whole story. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, I just would like to see step-by-step -step progress. But I, I'm finished over-promising. Uh, um. It would be good to, <laughs> if it turns out, that'll be good. And the, any progress we make in this will be important. Um, I'm disappointed we only have one biotherapeutic in asthma because we have so many targets. Um, and even in rheumatology, you know, they don't have an overwhelming number, but they have three or four that they can have or use. I mean, we still just have one. So uh, I'm hoping that some of these things will make a difference. You really don't have much coming down the pike, do you? Well, I, you know. Drug-wise. Yeah, you know, we were talking about the lack of studies in terms of patient-related studies. Well, think about it. You know, the whole antihistamine market has been collapsed, and it has for a number of years. Nobody's going to develop a new antihistamine. Uh, same is more or less true with steroids. It's not like uh, somebody's going to figure out a steroid that's uh, three logs more potent and have less side effects. Um, nobody's going to figure out a long-acting beta agonist that's any better uh, than some of the ones that we have. There'll be some that'll go 24 hours instead of 12. Um, but they'll still have the same questions about their potential but toxicity. You could, argue, you could argue that a leukotriene modifier modifiers are sort of one of these cytokine things because leukotrienes are a cytokine. Yeah. And so we've had that for quite a while, and it was one of those that was somewhat effective. And so I'm thinking of another drug that would attack something else along the pathway similar to a leukotriene. Oh, yeah, no, there's modifier. actually some very good targets in the leukotriene pathway. Um, and or in any of these other pathways. Yeah, the other pathways, I think we're stuck with biotherapeutics. In the leukotriene pathway, um, because it's <clears throat> lipids and chemicals, you have a better chance with small molecules. And there's a variety of unusual receptors and ligands that Josh Boyce and others have identified. But the problem with that is, you know, when you look at the leukotriene pathway, it's important. But if you take what slice of allergy or what slice of asthma is really going to be profoundly impacted by those kinds of mediators. We all know it's between maybe 10% to 20, 25% at most. So, you know, there's that's a, a chunk that's an important chunk, and we learned something about that, but it's not, it's not a huge thing, I don't think, in terms of the whole disease. Anyhow, we're well, not blind this time. We'll have to have you come back and tell us how we're doing. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Lanny. Sure. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.